been presented to them. Why could we not construct the needed infrastructure in time to meet okay. this increase yeah. in numbers? We, we did the mathematics. We did our analysis. Uh, we have a number of crafts that you need to uh, construct in order to uh, accommodate all the students that search as we have seen. Uh, we have number of dorms that you need to do. Uh, get fund, uh, securing funding uh, for this purpose. But even if we had all the money today, uh, we don't have the time to uh, do the construction so that every student will have an opportunity uh, to go to school. So uh, you have a choice as a nation uh, to use innovative approaches and strategies that have been used by countless number of countries, including right. the United States of America. The understanding is that GetFund has operated uh, in a manner where you get the money you construct, you get the money you construct. That approach is what they are changing right now as I speak with you. Uh, the approach should be against your projected revenue. Use that to do all your infrastructure today uh, so that you have an opportunity to pay it down. That has not been the approach. Now we're looking at a better approach in terms of ensuring that you can get all the money you need to construct. But in the meantime, we don't want to tell a student from Chibidi that, hey, sit at home until get fans find a new way of uh, doing construction so that all uncompleted buildings will be done. And okay. once you start at home, by the way, it's an opportunity. That is not something that we want to do. And the president that that he doesn't want to disappoint the children of this country, and especially when you're talking about 183. So if you have an approach, that would decongest schools. That will reduce class sizes, some increase enrollment, and give 183,000 the opportunity to assess secondary education, then why not? Uh, Doc, I'd ask you to hold the, the line for me. Angel Carbon is the president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, Gnagrat. He joins us on the other line. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Carbonu. Uh, we have the Deputy Minister of Education on the other line explaining the double track system. Is this good news for you or bad? Well, we as an association are going to have a National Executive Council meeting for an in-depth professional and technical discussion of this system. And after that meeting, which is a wider consultation of practitioners in education in this country, the association will come out with a communique, which will be the official position of the association. Have you been consulted by the ministry when this, um, form, when this policy was being formulated? Well, when you use the word consult, that is to say whether we were part of the formulation. We have had, we have been informed by the minister that this is the program that is going to be rolled out. Like almost every Ghanaian have been informed. We have also been informed. The feasibility of it, the challenges, the workability, and all that is what we said. We will have to subject it to wider representative discussion and come up with our position officially. Um, Dr. Duchum, so what is the arrangement like in the double track system? Um, how many days are the various streams supposed to stay in school, or is it a number of months? I, I think there's some confusion around that. Is 40 days uh, is generally half of a semester. That is the teaching uh, that they get. The first group will do 40 days, take their vacation. The next group that comes do the 81 days straight. You know, okay. so, so that is the alignment. So there's only one group that does the 40 days and take a break. But everybody else, you have 81 days, 81 days, 81 days. So, so it's 40 instructional days. I just wanted to get that clarification. No, no, so no. That it's not Actually, it's 40 instructional days. So you're talking about two full months. It's two months. Okay, thank you. Two months, yes. Right. Let, let, let me go back to the other line there since we have that clarification. Mr. Carbonu, according to the deputy minister there, it's two months. That is 40 instructional days. Hello. In, yes. 40 instructional days cannot yes. be months. 40 instructional days cannot but, be two months, please. When we talk about instructional days, we are mm. talking about the hours of instruction that a student gets within a day. School starts at 8 o'clock and closes at 1.30. That, and then you calculate it in terms of instructional hours and multiply the instructional hours 
to make it the number of hours that make a day. Well, Please. according to, yeah, Mr. Corbono, according to the working documents for this one, the, new, the school day is being adjusted so that it will be no, from 730 You cannot adjust to... the school days without my input because that has effect on me as a worker and it has, if, uh, I mean, the one about my working condition, are you increasing my working hours without my input? Is that what you are saying? Um, again, like, like Mr. Kaboni, like I said, the Deputy Minister is on the other line, so we just take some of these concerns to him. Dr. Duchum, so um, I have seen in this document, and that has been presented a number of times by the Minister, that um, uh, the instructional hours will change from eight, six hours in a day to eight hours in a day. And Mr. Kaboni is raising some concerns that as a teacher, that may extend the number of hours he works in a day. Your response? No, I, I don't think the uh, the radio, uh, with due respect to your uh, station, this is not where we we dis we negotiate on these issues. So uh, I've been worked out. Again, education service consulting headmasters will consult the union. No, we'll consult everyone. Um, so this is not something that we can just. But you will confirm that this change is being at a, made. At a radio station and come to a resolution. The only thing I know for sure is that it's something that works. I will engage, we'll discuss, we'll do whatever it takes to make sure the system works for the benefit of our students. Dr. Yaweduchum, the Deputy Minister of Education, you also heard the voice of the President of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, Angel Kabonu. Let's take the Joy Business Minute, and when we come back, we'll put those thoughts to Franklin. It's the Joy Business Minute. Hi, it's Daryl and Karen, our top stories. The institution appointed to help turn around Unibank is proposing liquidation of the bank. This is one of the several recommendations put forward to deal with the solvency issues Unibank is grappling with. Barclays Bank Ghana is forecasting a strong outlook for the city in the coming months. It says the city's strong performance would be influenced by inflows from the cocoa loan syndication as well as higher returns from crude oil exports. Almost half of commercial banks in the country are not providing credit history of their clients to the Credit Reference Bureau. That's according to the latest credit reference activity for last year released by the Bank of Ghana. And businesses are calling on the central bank to put in measures to ensure that the monetary policy rate has direct impact on the cost of credit. The Bank of Ghana has kept its key lending rate to commercial banks in the country at 17%. That's it for the Joy Business Minute. We'll be back at 3.06. At Afrodan, we believe that many of the problems people have with their health is as a result of the way they sit. In other words, your chair can kill you. Here's Dr. Marcus Mann of the Chiropractic and Wellness Center. What you have to remember is that the spine is the lifeline to your body. And posture is the window to that spine. Now, posture is affected by your daily activities and habits like sitting. That's why at the Chiropractic and Wellness Centers, we recommend what I believe to be the best chairs available for preventing not only subluxations, but also other health problems that you may not be aware of, and that's Rabami and Mobilex chairs. Unfortunately, on a daily basis, I have to correct the effects of this poor sitting habit in our business men and business women. Always remember, optimal spine equals optimum health. So, for the sake of your health, buy Rabami or Mobilex chairs from Afrodan. We are on the first floor of the Swansea Shopping Arcade. Telephone 663-085. Hey, Kwame. Hmm. What's up here? My brother. My wife has been diagnosed with cancer. What? Uh, my brother is here with kidney disease too. Oh. Do you know the World Health Organization estimates that over 16,000 new cases of cancers are diagnosed annually in Ghana and kidney diseases account for 10% of all medical admissions to Kolebu? But thanks to Glycocritical Illness Plan, Joseph, I have spent over 20,000 Ghana cities on my younger brother's disease. Yeah. yeah. What is GSIP? Glycocritical Illness Plan, GSIP, provides you with financial support when diagnosed with any critical illness or dread disease such as cancers, strokes, kidney failures. Speak to Glycolife today on 0302-218-500 for your GSIP policy. It is definitely in our interest to survive. Glycolife, we cushion you for life. Time waits for no man. The future belongs to the brave. Nothing comes without a fight. Fight for a better future. Fight to change the world. Make your mark. 
at Academic City College with its new campus in Hacho Accra. With activity-based learning and premium teaching talent, take your education beyond the theoretical classroom. Visit www.acghana.com. Admissions open now for September 2018. Academic City, unlocking potential, one leader at a time. Hi listeners, I am Agnes Bell Adam Carter by name, beloved to be called as Miss Journalist. My dream is to become a renowned journalist in Ghana. My passion of becoming a TV anchor cum journalist is taking shape at where I am today, Blue Crest Cali. Guess what? I'm a Blue Crest Media Lab recording and this can tell you how close my dream is becoming a reality. Millions out there with aspirations to become a renowned journalist come and experience Blue Crest College. Choose Blue Crest College. For admission, call or WhatsApp 0263-011-390 or 207-783. Visit our website bluecrest.edu.gh. Blue Crest College. Education for life. It's time to experience something different, unexpected, and definitely beyond banking. It's a new era at GCB Bank, Ghana's most welcoming bank, where we offer you a world of financial security, flexibility, and convenience. We swiftly serve you with over 180 branches and 300 ATMs, and provide e-banking solutions that make it possible for you to bank anywhere, anytime. When you need a personal loan, sooner is better than later, so we give it to you in 24 hours to make sure the experience is always memorable. At GCB, your opportunities are limitless and we keep you smiling at all times. We're bigger and better, ready to take you beyond banking. GCB Bank, your bank for life. Are you a winner? Do you want to realize your dreams? Go for gold. Cowbell Gold. A fortified choco milk drink made from the finest cocoa from Ghana. Whatever you do, wherever you are, win in life. Go for gold. Cowbell Gold. Energy for winners. This advert has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Solar Tech. The power to protect. Yes! Solartec, your tried and trusted brand, is your total solution to all power problems, whether low voltage, high voltage, power surges, spikes, brownouts, or what have you. Solartec fully protects your valuable equipment. No matter your appliance, we have the perfect Solartec for you. Choose from my tried and trusted range, such as fridge guard, TV guard, high volt guard, multi guard, AVS 13, AVS 30, AC guard, Solartec TV stab, Solartec fridge stab, UPS, and Solartec voltage stabilizer. Beware of counterfeit Solartec products. Get your genuine Solartec products today at our Abelinpe office and all our authorized dealers across the country. Contact us at number 10 Yiwa Street, Abelinpe, or call 0302-761450 or 0302-775106. Solartec, the power to protect. It's nine minutes past nine on the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM. I am Daniel Dazi here in the studio with Franklin Kujo, president of Imani Africa. On the phone with us is Dr. Prince Ama. He's the president, executive director, I should say, for the Institute for Educational Studies, IFES. Let me begin with you, Franklin. So yesterday we had Kofi Bento on the line with us, but I think he didn't mince any words when he said that this double track system is not needed now without a doubt um and mr kofi bento who is my senior vice president at imani was part of a team uh, that had met uh, president nanado then candidate nanado uh, over breakfast and we were discussing free shs this was in 2012 and uh, we held our positions and said well listen um you may want to go ahead and do the blanket one, but we still think that you need to target it properly. Means testing is important. It is very important to note that just yesterday, the finance minister at around, around 9.57 p.m., I think, on uh, your, uh, 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 a cousin station of yours, uh, City FM, said the following. 
And I quote him, on the issue of free education, it may be that there has to be changes about the way we are administering it. I can't take my child to Achimota School or Dogono and leave him or her there and don't pay anything when I can pay for 10 people. I think we need to have the data and begin to discriminate on the free SHS and allow those who can afford to pay. I think it is time to open up about the policy and take on board suggestions on how to improve it. We have arrived. Mm. Because the very position Imani held when we had that faithful meeting was that, look, there are people who can afford to pay. And the best way to help poor people is actually to do targeted well, well, means testing, find out those who can pay, then save significant resources, use it to get a lot more people into the school system, but also use it to also expand. Mm. So get fund may be interested in maybe raising money now in order to expand infrastructure. If anybody tells you that we didn't know that we'll get to this position, they are not being sincere with the truth. Because on the score of let me, you, you are moving to another point. That's why I want to bring you. To no, I just wanted to, to make a one. point quickly. Yeah, you know, um, because listening to the conversation between uh, Doctor Angel Duchum and Angel Carbon, there's some s slight suggestion that we had not done as if we haven't done proper work. Look, when we did that, when we did that um, encounter with the Nanado, then we went ahead and did a lot of calculations based on the EMIS data. Uh, we projected that in 2018, the total population in SHS1 was going to be 637, for, well, 637,000. But based on the 70% pass rate, we were going to likely get, what, 435,000, 424,000 students who would be needed to go into SHS, SHS1. What's the figure you have from the education The ministry? 2018 projection, in according to the Education Ministry, is total registered BECE candidates mm -hmm. 521,000, mm -hmm. number placed 497,000, yeah. and number enrolled 472,000. So, so just we about 30,000. 30,000. 30, if anybody tells you that we even projected, we went ahead and projected 2019, 2020. So it cannot be the case that we didn't foresee what we're having today. Yeah. So for anybody to wake up in the middle of the night, through some professors, and then they start telling you double track, multi track, uh, what's it called, multi system, whatever it is that is being played. Then within the shakes of a lambstill, in two days, a whole ministry, without having touched through the policy implications of this, comes and blesses this policy, tells you what we describe as policy logicality at Imani, complete breakdown in policy coherence and anything to do with logical policy making. So I'm not entirely surprised. First of all, the whole idea of having, you're even reducing the contact hours, right? It's actually because increased in the end. You're uh, increasing not, not, the number of contact hours I in mean, a day. I mean, the number of man students who stay yeah, in Yeah, the school. students who stay in school for eight months. Yeah. But the number of contact hours will increase. By an hour or more. By two, two hours two every hours. day. All right. Well, then there's Saturday as well. Yeah, when Saturday is supervised learning. Supervised learning. Then you'll be paying people to do what? To, to learn on Saturdays. You mean the teachers? So yeah, Saturday to, to, to supervise Saturday them. School. Saturday school. Yeah, you can see it. it's like prep. Mm, yeah. Like how uh, schools have prep in yeah. the evenings. Yeah. And then they give you examples of countries that are doing the same. I think they've mentioned a country like Japan, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Look, in Japan, California has yeah, also yeah, done yeah. the same. Hold on. In Japan, they do it because they want students to, to have education passing through them, not passing through education. So the number of months they spend uh, doing this shift system is actually to be to inculcate practical lessons where they then feed into I mean which feeds into the theory. So what this is book I may sit at home and chew on lesson notes. Maybe let's even forget about that, that, that type of conversation. The fact of the matter is that we cannot be making policy for education in this manner. Not long ago, Professor Joseph Anamwa did a brilliant report, I recall, based upon which President Kufor decided to do four year senior high school. Another president came, and because of the same political ring marrow or whatever it is, decided that it would be three years. I thought we had departed with this, this shameful behavior of changing people's livelihoods by the stroke of a pen. So what has happened right now? There was no proper conversation. Otherwise, why would Angel Kabonu, who heads NAGRAT, National Association of Graduate Teachers, be even having a banter with uh, Deputy Minister of Education, 
over a serious policy issue that was just dreamt a couple of days ago. When is the one going to teach the people? When is the okay. one going to teach the people? Um, okay, Franklin, I have I have a quick question on what you raised earlier about having a targeted policy. Yes. Okay. A, a similar one, a similar question was put to uh, the minister in a forum that I was in, and he mentioned that the right is for the child, not for the parent. The consideration is being given what to the I child, that and so according to no. our constitution which allows that every child should have access to education and he should not pay for it. Mm. And so the right, the child is being given the right. Not, it's not a matter of parents who can pay and parents who well, can't pay. The presumption pay. is that the parents has no total, any control, any contribution to make in the child's education at all. It's not as if these parents are, for, are not allowing their children to be educated. The definition of a right to education has nothing to do about the payment position. It has everything to do with people who... I mean, the access has been provided, but they are not sending the awards to school. I mean, that's when you can coerce that type of right. It's, it's a bit disingenuous to suggest that as a parent, you don't know what is good for your world. In any case, the argument ought to be made. Why are you paying fees for wards whose chop buses and trunks are overflowing with conflicts, corned beef, and sardines? When my vice president, senior vice president, Kofi Bento, used to visit his, his wards in Cape Coast, because he has very beautiful girls who went to Cape Coast schools, public schools. Uh, very in, beautiful and very smart girls as well. Anytime he was going, the provisions he bought for them alone, it was about four times the school fees at the time. Why should Mr. Bentel enjoy free SHS? Hold on, on that, hold on to that thought. Let me come to Dr. Prince Sama, who has joined us on the line. Uh, we are continuing the conversation that we started yesterday, Dr. Ama. In the first place, Franklin makes the points, Franklin Kujo here in the studio makes the points that the premise for the free SHS, making it a blanket policy, was flawed to begin with. He also makes the point that this double-track system was not planned for well, and that is why proper consultation was not done. And he's surmising that from the conversation he's had between Angel Kabonu and Dr. Yaweduchum. Do you agree or not? Uh, thanks very much, and good morning to your church uh, listeners, and uh, good morning to Franklin. Um, I, I hope our meeting will uh, come on, Franklin. Yeah, we have um, to meet. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that if we have listened to the argument that we made um, previously, we were also on the side that um, if it is possible, the government could consider expanding the opportunity for people who um, uh, who can't pay, and then for individuals who can afford to pay, um, the, the the system should allow them to do so. Uh, however, uh, I think that the issue has been the availability of data. At the moment, there is some piloting of this means testing uh, being done by Comfed, and so data is being collected to see how it is possible for mean testing to be done. But I think the whole argument is whether or not we should provide access for everybody to enjoy secondary school, regardless of whether their parents can afford or not. Most developed countries have, have looked at the... Um, can I pack well? And then, just a second. Just a second, I'm back. All right. Right. Um, Doc. Yes, Daniel. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to park well because I was driving when the call came through. Okay, so, then. Yes, so the, the argument is that at the moment we have moved away from whether or not uh, it should have been targeted or, or, or should, should have been wholesale. What it is is where we find ourselves in and the fact that our young people have been provided access to secondary education. Mm. The government says that it has the political will, the political commitment, and the financial resources to allow everybody to go to secondary education. And remember that we are operating under the, the SDG4 that says that everybody must have equal and equitable access to secondary education. And that means that um, regardless of your family background, uh, you should be able to have access to secondary education. Now, so where we have gotten to is a point where we have got an expanded access to secondary education. And we must pride ourselves in that. So 
if we have got to that point and we have issues with facility, what innovative approaches can we uh, implement? And frankly, made, made a very important point about Professor Anamwan Minister and showed how, how he, he respects his, 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 his opinion and his report. And, 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 and to the extent that, as we speak now, the, uh, the, the, the proposal on the multi track system, you know, has Professor Anamwan Minister, the, the same man that he respects his, his, his uh, uh, policy suggestions in respect of the, the report that was submitted, is at the forefront of designing this. The, the multi track system is well tested model. It's a, it's, a policy, it's a policy and a program that has been implemented in many countries. And the results are not bad. There is no evidence that tends to suggest that um, the multi-track system has reduced learning outcomes. Um, and and, and to, that, to that extent, we say that it will be inimical for, okay. for us to implement. We are doing right. something that is making very good use of our of facilities. But it doesn't uh, it seem also, rushed to you, Doc? Doesn't it seem rushed to you, considering the time that we have to the opening of the next academic year? See, for some of us, That's we are aware that the, this is the path that will be taken um, as we go along. But there has to be some discussions. I, I don't know whether Imani was involved uh, in some of these discussions, but for us at IFES, we have had this discussion for a very long while now okay. because we looked at the numbers and we saw that, look, there are some re-entries coming in. But young people, some people felt that um, even if they finished secondary school, they were not going to get uh, admission, probably. So there were a lot of dropouts who found themselves into the system. And that's why, for the first time, we've seen the huge jump in, in, uh, in, in BC uh, candidates. So you predicted this happening years. So you predicted this happening a while back? Yes, of course. But the figures... That and your suggestion was a double-track system? Yes, the suggestion was double-track system because that is the only way, if we cannot provide facilities at the moment. And I think that there's no way going back uh, in terms of allowing everybody to go to secondary school or providing universal secondary education. There's no way going back. And so if we cannot have um, the physical infrastructure at this time, and we do have well-tested models of, 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 of making very good and judicious use of resources, okay. then don't we implement it? And so we are, and, and, and many of, uh, many of the... Um, policy suggestions have come from the some of the civil societies have come from academia. At what point did you make the suggestion, Doc? Uh, when did you make the suggestion? Uh, it has been on the, the on the table, the discussion um, as far back as I think March, March, April. But there was discussions around um, the uh, members of the academic. Fraternity. Okay, on that's March and April of this year. Yes, yes, that's been okay. discussion long. Uh, myself and Professor Anna Mohamed had uh, quite a number of meetings. Doc, I hate to do this. I, I hate to do this, but we've been joined on the line by Prof. Stephen Adair. He's on the other line. Let me take a, a, a word from him as well before I come back to the studio. Prof, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. Prof, so uh, we understand that um, you are not against this double track system, the implementation of this double track system. Well, I am not just against. I am positively in support of it. <laughs> well, you have run institutions yourself. You have run uh, second cycle institutions yourself. Would you implement this policy there? Well, actually, to some extent, I implement not exactly the same, but something close to it when I was in Gimpa. I had the regular programs. I came to meet in the day and in the evening. I had the Green Hill College, which was the mature students. Basically, it is not the institutions that I have run, they didn't have the challenge that we have today, whereby if we are not careful, we have about 100 students in a secondary school classroom with one teacher. It's a recipe for disaster. The ideal solution is to have more or less double the secondary schools we have in Ghana. And I and you know 
that even under the most ideal situation, we cannot do it in the next 10 to 15 years. So there's no choice. It's a matter of... <laughs> well, well um, Prof, you see, yeah. this policy was suggested in 2012. And yes. the number of spaces that we need to cover this year are 180,000. If you look at the projections that have been made from as far back as 2012, we could have yes. well catered for these spaces. 180,000 more already. I think that the existing numbers in the school are already too many for them. So it's, this is additional. So the 180 is additional. Yes, on. yes, that is, that, that, is, that is established. What I'm asking is that could we not have provided for these spaces before this point so that now that we are looking at this in a month, we now have to change the entire education system from three semesters, three terms to two semesters, and we have a double track system and all the questions that follow. First of all, there was attempt under the previous government to build schools. They wanted to build 100 schools. 200 ended actually. Up with about 12 being built. But I tell you that even if all the hundred schools had been built, they would not have been enough. So it's a question of, I think that we, as a country, we, and we have done many things wrong, we had planned systematically over the decades to be gradually increasing our number of secondary schools of, say, the past, during the Fourth Republic, about 10 to 15 a year. We could have solved the problem. But that is not what we could have done. At this moment, we have a serious crisis. Whether you like it or not, the politicians have decided, and I think rightly so, that there should be free SHS. Because those who say that we should delay, I always tell them the answer is, let your children stay at home, not go to secondary school. Okay. Let the other people go to secondary school, and after five or ten years, your children can come. So I think that the free senior secondary school is here and to stay. We have an overcrowding system. There's no way in the next five to ten years we'll be able to build even sufficient secondary schools. So what is the next best solution? That's what I'm more interested in. And if you come to that point, then this solution is the best. Prof, when the shift system was being suggested in for the for the system. no i'm i'm referring to a different system when the okay. shift system was being suggested in the basic schools it was being suggested as a stopgap measure for a short period this yeah. we've also been informed by the ministry is being suggested uh, for 5 to 7 years we have not taken the ministry has failed to show us a plan to fill the infrastructure deficit in these 7 years the shift system in the basic school I, I, I referred to took about two decades to remove. Are we saying that we should accept another temporary plan when we do not have any idea at the moment how we are going to build the infrastructure needed? So, so that for how long, for instance, are we going to take this double track system? First of all, let us separate two things. The building of the infrastructure of seven or ten years I and you must hold the parties involved, the politicians, accountable. I think that that whether they will be able to do it in 10 years, 7 years, the present imperatives require a solution. Number two, actually, having a double track system is not necessarily have to be Temporary, Japan, Australia, uh, Costa Rica, Kenya have them as a permanent feature of their system. In fact, I've just learned that several thousand schools in America today have it as a permanent feature of their system. Okay. So, but whatever happens, since population will increase, if we don't hold the politicians accountable to build more schools in 10 to 15 years, even the double track will be overpopulated. So, therefore, I agree with you that there must be a solid plan, not Ghanaians will call it math math, to systematically improve okay. the infrastructure. Prof, uh, yes. please please hold on a moment. Uh, we have Dr. Finsama on the other line, Raymond and Franklin are in the studio. Let me give a quick word to Raymond. Um, you've been quiet throughout this whole discussion. Yes, I think there is something key that's not been identified. First and foremost, this was government policy. 
and nobody opposed providing education to Ghanaian students. Indeed, even the constitution is very clear, 25.1b. It states clearly that secondary education in its different forms, including technical and vocational education, shall be made generally available and accessible to all by every appropriate means, and in particular by the progressive introduction of free education. That was not in doubt. Now, when the government decides to go ahead and do the free education, disregarding all the calls for targeting, which I thought was a very reasonable call, it is incumbent on the government to show the way forward from the beginning. What is happening today is a clear-cut problem of lack of planning, proper planning. We knew it. We knew the numbers. The projections were pretty clear. But government still decided to go without this particular proper planning in place. And that is where right. we are here today. It is not as if we came here by chance. So rallying people around an emergency situation to work around it is the problem today. Ray, I'll come to Franklin with these same thoughts. But really, haven't we gone beyond the argument of we should have seen it earlier? Why have we seen it now? The point is we have a, a gap of 180,000 that we need to find space for them. It is because we did not plan properly. That's why we may not be able to but deal with it. But now we are here. No, we may not be able to deal with the 180,000 the way we ought to deal with it if we still do the short work of doing the interim measures. But the at the moment, the bottom line, is we are here. Yeah, it is it's staring us in the face, well, frankly. I agree with everything uh, Raymond has said because Raymond understands careful planning and targeting. Um, what it is is that the private SHS providers came to our offices not long ago and complained, showed us pictures of buildings that are quite well, actually more nicer than even some of the public ones that have been abandoned by parents simply because some free jamboree is being provided elsewhere, right? And they went there telling us that, look, could you just advocate, let government bring us to the table? And even if it's a voucher system, since they are paying for people, give us vouchers, let's accommodate some of the students because we have the space. In fact, there was one building that was shown that was far nicer than uh, which school is that, Prempe. They were telling me, I forgot the name of the school. And there's space. So what you do right now, emergency situation, is yeah. not to do some double-track, multi-track, multi-system thing. Yeah. Talk to the private school providers. There's a lot of space there. That's what you do. And I thought that that's the way we would approach policy. You see, policy, education is not like a vaccination you give. So people are now being affected by polio or something. Then you carry them and go and give them vaccination. After that, they have to eat. You have to prepare the grounds for people to receive education education should not be treated like some toy and Isn't in spite a simplistic of it's argument simplistic. Uh, to to raise this private schools issue for ah, instance how many places are how many places do they have what is the uh, condition of those private schools who are teaching them in those private they schools have, have we looked at all of those they have so much space they have space of over i think around i think 200,000 210 the last they came and i can give you the names of the of the of the of the extract i'll give them to you you talk to them they have spaces. And it's not a question about, of course, don't we know that the private instructions sometimes are probably better? But in any case, you are dealing That's with in basic e schools. Well, you are dealing with an emergency right now. And the best thing you should do is to look out for play, or, or, or opportunities that exist in the private sector. Are you suggesting that the spaces in the public schools, every they, all they have are good teachers? They all have good teachers, far better than those but in they the private all school. have they all have certified teachers. But that's all assumptions that, that are private, accept, acceptable. But you're assuming that the private SHS tutors are not are not certified. It's not an assumption. So the education no, ministry. No, I'm telling you why I'm. Not. I'm telling you why I'm not assuming. The education ministry carried out a survey and absorbed thirteen thousand two hundred seats coming from private schools into the system. So yes, some private schools. I think there are about fourteen or so schools. Some private schools have been added, but, as you but know, the information we have from them, at least, yeah. But the data we've always mm. known is that even if you look at those who progress eventually to uh, tertiary institutions, where are they coming from? They're coming from public senior high schools most of the time. Well, for but, tertiary institutions. For tertiary. Yeah. But the point I'm making is that you cannot claim that because these schools may not have, and the, the emphasis is conditional, may not have qualified teachers. You don't need to get them, you don't need to use their spaces. I mean, what's the point in rushing to do something like this when there are spaces available? And it's money you are spending anyway. 
Unless, of course, but this is a government that prides itself on uh, engaging the private sector, right? So and, why and would you want to do that? Two schools, Dr. Osaya Oduchum's senior high school. Exactly. And also, Pop Sastem Nadez Christian high school. Christian high school. Who is telling me that these are substandard schools with the wrong teachers teaching in there? That's, that's and a these misnomer. are public schools that have absorbed, for the record. Who is telling me that these are schools that cannot provide the services that the students will need in these schools? So, I mean, the argument, really, I feel, is that we still want to do this because we think it's the way forward. Even the presumption that it's a mid-term or short-term event is not going to happen. And, and, and then Yeah, but to think that you are, going to, you, are in, you are instituting a policy like this over a weekend... Some professor just started speaking on radio. Before we knew it, three days later, the ministry adopts it as policy. Is this how we should do? In po- we should be making policy in this country. But there was engagements going engagement on before. Who? <laughs> and Jacobanu <laughs> just told you that nobody engaged them. He said, "I'm the one teaching." And Jacobanu is the president of the Nagrat, and, and teachers have not been engaged, and parents have not been engaged. This is symbolic. I, I'm surprised that anybody okay. would be suggesting that this is a way to organize policy. I can understand that the politicians have abandoned the ship, but the rest of us who deal with education must call them to order. We should never, okay. under any circumstance, actually support this wishy-washy policy. It is dangerous. By the way, the countries they are mentioning, they are moving away. Kenya, the, I just read a whole report. I think I have had review report. They are moving away they are from this this shift system, education. They are re, review. What about it. the other countries? The Kenya other is countries, not the only country what they do is that. Australia, listen, Costa Rica, that, Japan. please, please stop. That, that, let's <laughs> let's, let's, let's stop confusing ourselves. They are ensuring that practical lessons are imbibed as well, not rote learning. Why? So some people go to school for four months, they come and sit at home, okay. chew on lesson notes, and don't do anything. It's the same thing we wanted to do with GHS. Mm-hmm. We never got around doing the masonry and the carpentry and anything. So what are we doing? Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Kujo, fact, parents, hold on a moment. Parents, parents, should, parents, parents should actually start speaking because it's their, me, I'll never take my word to any of these uh, double, track, double track thing. They are not there yet. They will never go. Okay. Um... <sighs> Frank Nikujo is a voice you just heard. Professor Stephen Ade is on the line. Very important uh, point made there by Franklin that we should, and Raymond also, that we should be able to pull in private schools. And that would, be, since those schools are there, those schools have experience of teaching students, that would be a better policy in the interim than what he calls a wishy washy measure of applying a double track system. This quickly. Well, Hello, Prof. It's well, getting... for my comment on this. Yes, yes, yes. First of all, I think that not all the private secondary schools, the excellent secondary schools are not available for the government. I mean, Ghana Christian International is not available to receive any students, SOS, Thema International. Why not, so, Prof? Because we are full and we are numbers are there and we don't need any more students. We don't want to take more students. But there are spaces in several private schools. And I, if I hear it well, in fact, this year, they have allowed every student to choose one private secondary school as a fourth or fifth choice. So those who the ministry are here have access to have the requisite space and capacity. I don't think that there is 210 capacity. I've, I know some of the private schools there they are not of that. I doubt whether they will have 200. Anyone who is saying 210 spaces, I will challenge them. The third, Your figures that, have yes, been challenged. You should bring the private secondary schools who are willing and have the space in them, and the government should give them the vouchers, what they will have spent in the public schools to them. Secondly, I don't think that this is a, a one night day wonder shambolic has been described. I think that most countries which have had to open up to secondary education to everyone, free education, has had this challenge of being overcrowded. And therefore, the fact that in the past, and the past should not be, it's all our Ghanaians and our previous governments not planned and built sufficient secondary schools it's, yes, yeah, true, but that does not answer to the question today. Given the circumstances, what's the best option? 
And I believe that bringing the private schools as they are doing and having this two-track system is the right way. As to quality, I don't think that the quality will be uh, In fact, the quality will be better. I just checked last year, visited one secondary school, speaking there, and I was shocked with overcrowding. And therefore, mm. having them there will be the lesser of two evils. I remember we are not talking about the ideal. The ideal is for everybody. In my school, the students are not more than 30 in the classroom. That's the ideal. But we are talking about the second best. And okay. I think that having those two track system, given the circumstance of today, I don't care about what you are talking about, what we didn't do at the past and other things. Today, it is the better okay. of all options. Thank you very much, Professor Stephen Adair. He's the former rector of Gimpa, and he was there speaking uh, also with his expertise as someone who owns a senior high school, a private senior high school. 30 seconds to you, Franklin, to wrap up. What is clear in this conversation is that the enough, not enough engagement had been done from the teacher's side, Nagrat has told you. From the private school side, they haven't been engaged properly because there are spaces. If you haven't engaged, you wouldn't even know the number of spaces. And by the way, the finance minister is the one paying the bill. And just yesterday night, 9.54 p.m., 9.57 p.m., he said the same thing. On the issue of free education, I'm quoting him, it may be that there has to be changes about the way we are administering it. I can't take my child to Achimota School or Dogono and leave him or her there and don't but pay anything. But that doesn't address the space issue. The what issue space? of... He's, he's, there, he's addressing the issue. No, he's saying it's, that if you are you see, he's not addressing space. He's no, addressing see, costs. Yeah, but, but you are forgetting but one thing. But if you thing. target if the you, policy, if, if you target everyone the policy, will still get the chance to yeah, go. Yeah, but if you target the policy and you pay, there will be enough money to expand the facilities. But the problem here is not more money. The education minister has said, even if we have all the money, we don't have the time But that's to because we in. just woke up and heard about the, pro the challenge they have, the claim they have, when they, it was already staring them in the face. Okay. It was poor planning. Let's just admit it. So your point was, it was poor plan. And the finance minister who is paying the bill is saying that, look, I think we need to take a look again okay. at this. And that sh sh we shouldn't be afraid to say we are wrong. All right. Uh, Franklin Kujo, president of Imani Africa, thank you so much for joining us. This is still Pleasure. the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you looking for opportunity to study abroad? Are you facing...